troubles and needs. Never forget that so much of motivation is tied up in communication. People want to know why are they being asked to do something. It's not enough to say, because I told you so. I told you so is an instant turnoff. Certainly there are times when it's unavoidable. But the small amount of time it takes to explain things usually pays big dividends. Take this past season, for example. The problem I had going in was that I had too many good players. Too many who deserved to play. Doesn't sound like a bad problem, right? Wrong. In sports, very often having too many good players is just as much a negative as having too few. Having too many players often creates jealousies and dissensions, chances that eat at the heart of any group. So I knew that if we didn't find a way to solve this problem as a team, we definitely were not going to be in any position to win a national championship. I wondered what to do about it. Then, one day in the fall, I met with the team and told them about my problem. I said, here is the problem I have as a coach, and you are either all going to help me solve it, or I'm going to solve it myself autocratically. Which one is it going to be? The point is, I gave them a chance to be part of the solution. They understood they were all being asked to sacrifice some of their individual goals, in the name of the collective good, and that if we all somehow found a way to solve this problem, they had a chance to become part of basketball history, which is what ended up happening. The fact that our players understood the goal we had to accomplish resulted in the 1996 NCAA championship. Confront problems immediately. Problems don't go away by themselves. It's human nature to want to have problems disappear by themselves. To believe that time really does heal all wounds. It doesn't. If you let problems fester, they usually only get worse. Yet sometimes it makes sense to sleep on a problem and not react spontaneously or out of emotion or anger. But once you calm down, it's best to deal with people right away and talk things out. Not in an in-your-face confrontational way, but by listening and trying to communicate. Let's say you're having trouble with your boss and you don't think your boss likes you. What do you do about it? Ask her for a few minutes of her time and simply ask her if she had a problem with you. Not in a hostile manner, not by trying to put her on the defensive, but by saying that you sense there's a problem. It's got you concerned and you'd like to try to straighten it out. So many times you will find out, one, you've overreacted and she really doesn't have any negative feelings about you. Or two, the problem is a result of a misunderstanding. The point is that you've given the problem a form in which it can be resolved, which is always better than letting it hang over your head where all it does is create anxiety, discontent, and the potential to magnify. Maybe you will find out that your boss does have a problem with you. If so, at least you have identified what the specific problem is and can take steps to correct it. If nothing else, bringing it to the boss's attention makes you look like a committed person whose job is important to you. And if you find out that this person does have a problem with you, and that it's something that can't be resolved, at least you know and can act accordingly. You have a choice, depending on your economic situation. You can leave or start looking to change jobs, or possibly rethink your career choice. Or you can try to find ways to make the best of unfortunate circumstances. Either way, you have taken action. You have exerted some control over the situation, and you have done that by communicating. Reinforce good performances. Minutes after we won the national championship at the Brendan Byrne Arena in the Meadowlands and had come back into the locker room, I sensed that Antoine Walker, our star sophomore, was not as happy as he should have been. Although we had won, he had not had one of his better games. Now, Antoine is a great talent, but he had come to Kentucky from Chicago as a great high school player who was selfish with the ball. That never bothered me, because a lot of high school stars are selfish. My task as a motivator was to make him more team-oriented, while not putting a blanket on either his talent or his competitiveness. It's a delicate balance. You need to have the player think team first and realize that the group's success is more important than his own, but you also don't want him to lose his uniqueness as a player. So when Antoine began using his passing skills and began playing less selfishly, I publicly pointed this out. Whenever I had the chance, I would tell people that Antoine's willingness to alter his own game was what was making us a great team. With Antoine, as with all my players, and with all people you are trying to lead. You must constantly stress to everyone that when the group does well, everyone benefits. When the sea rises, all the boats rise with it. It's true in sports, it's true in business, it's true in life. And when you're asking people to subordinate some of their individual goals for the sake of the group, you must let them know you are aware of their sacrifice. You must constantly thank them for it. So when I saw in the locker room that Antoine wasn't as happy as he should have been, 
I quickly took him into the bathroom, hugged him, and told him the truth. I thanked him for giving me the best moment of my basketball life, thanked him for his unselfishness, and for being such an important part of our team. Made him aware that without him, we wouldn't have won the national championship. He instantly brightened and was fine after that. People must also be made to understand that there will be a tangible reward if the group is successful. It might be more money, it might be added respect from their peers, it might be external praise, but it will be something. They must know that they will benefit if the leader does well, and vice versa. It's the essence of any great organization. Don't burn bridges. The art of listening is looking at someone when they speak to you, not over his or her shoulder at who else might be in the room. At a basic level, this is merely being courteous, treating people the way we should like to be treated. It's also just smart. None of us knows what lies down the road. We don't know what's going to happen to the people we are meeting now. Someday those people you're virtually dismissing could be in a position to help you in business. What impression are you making on them? Remember that we are all in the business of trying to create the best impression possible. And we never know who is watching us, assessing us. Once I was talking to a sports writer I knew, who happened to be standing with someone else. I completely ignored the other person, almost to the point of being rude. Later, I learned that the person was the sports editor of one of the biggest newspapers in the country. I don't know exactly what impression that person got of me, but I know it wasn't good. Why should it have been? Try to create allies, not enemies. One of the most difficult parts of my job is dealing with the media and realizing that eventually someone is going to write something about me that I don't think is fair. There are two ways to handle it. I can turn the other cheek and move on, or I can pick up the phone and deal with that person. As a young coach, I used to say, the hell with it. When someone wrote something about me that I thought was not only wrong, but unfair. I didn't think it was important to spend time clearing things up. Now, at 44, I've learned that that's not always the best way to deal with it. Maybe there's some sense of truth to what was said about me. Or maybe it's the result of some sort of misunderstanding or misinterpretation. The only way to find out is to communicate with that person. Pick up the phone. Communicate. It may not get anything resolved, but by trying to resolve the problem, you begin turning a negative into a positive. You have opened the door for reconciliation. Step six. Learn from role models. I learned at a young age that you can learn a lot from the experiences of people around you. Lessons that you can make part of your own arsenal. I went to college in the early 70s, a time of great racial tension at the University of Massachusetts. The man who had first recruited me to UMass was a black man named Ray Wilson, who once had been Julius Irving's high school basketball coach, and had seen me play a high school game in the Long Island Coliseum. Ray taught me my first big lesson on how to trust people. He broke down all the racial barriers because he never dealt with people in terms of black and white. He made it impossible to have prejudices. Taught me it didn't matter whether you were black or white, city or suburban, we were all people. He was always himself, and he showed me the value of sticking to your guns even when you're going against the grain. He also taught me the importance of listening. I was an emotional kid, and he would often give me the chance to vent, and then he would simply state his opinion very matter-of-factly. He would watch my highly charged, youthful performance a while, then he'd say, are you listening to yourself, Rick? Are you listening to yourself? He became a very large role model in my life. To this day, whenever I talk about the ability to listen, I am paying a debt to Ray Wilson and his influence on me. But there is a point here that transcends the specifics of what Ray Wilson gave me. Once you've established your work ethic, once you've demonstrated that you're willing to arrive early, stay late, and put in the effort it's going to take to be successful, you are on your way to becoming a motivated person. Now you must become equally committed to doing things the correct way. Remember, perfect practice makes perfect. How do you find the right way? You must remember that many people have made the journey before you. Some of them enjoyed success. Some of them experienced failure. All of them can teach you something. Role models can enable you to both learn from experience you haven't had yet or may never have. We all emulate those around us, even if we don't know we're doing it. Little children take on habits of their parents. Later they learn from what they see around them. It's the way we come of age. You see this in sports all the time. Kids go out to the playground and mimic what they saw the great players do on television the night before. They copy those great moves and try to incorporate them into their own games. Modeling ourselves after others is how we learn in life. Identifying role models, though, is a little more complicated. In theory, role models are the people we look up to. 
the ones we want to emulate. 